Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long discussion between a guest host and the author of a new book. This week, NPR foreign correspondent Deborah Amos talks about the plight of Sunni Muslims in the Middle East after the fall of Saddam Hussein's Sunni-dominated government in Iraq. She looks at what has happened to Sunnis in Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon. Ms. Amos discusses her book with Mohammed Bazi, Middle Eastern Studies Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and Journalism Professor at New York University. I'm here with Deborah Amos, author of Eclipse of the Sunnis, uh, Power, Exile, and Upheaval in the Middle East. Um, Deborah, you argue that Iraq is now a virtual country. Uh, with so many of its people outside of its borders. What does that mean exactly? How does Iraq function as this virtual country? In the refugee communities in Damascus, Amman, Beirut, um, Iraqis recreate a little bit of home. It's most interesting with this population because the internet only came to Iraq in 2000 under Saddam. And then you had to go to a local library or some institution. You had to sign up. It was all, you know, it was, it was really quite watched. Um, in 2003, um, Iraqi bloggers uh, took off. Uh, and in, in a way, they were ahead of other bloggers throughout the region in 2003. So, so they took to this, especially young Iraqis, took to this new technology, which was newer to them than anybody else in the region. As refugee populations, these are middle class educated people. And so they have their cell phones, they sit in internet cafes, they're in chat rooms with each other. And unlike any other refugee population I know, they are able to keep in touch daily. They watch Iraqi television, which you know you can do because of the satellite channels. And in a way, um, they break themselves off from the country they're living in and, and recreate this Baghdad. A and so they're quite aware of details of politics, everything that's happening on the streets, um, violence that sometimes you and I don't hear about, uh, but mm -hmm. they know because they're in touch all the time, every day, and, and very keenly aware of political movements, who's up, who's down. I've never quite seen anything like it in a refugee population. Your title is Eclipse of the Sunnis, which is something that must make Sunnis in Iraq and elsewhere angry. Um, how did you come up with this title? And also, is it a reference to Sunnis in Iraq? Is it a reference to the larger place of Sunnis in the Arab world today? You know, the book started out being called First Leave Everything You Love. And mm -hmm. it was a much gentler title. And mm -hmm. it comes from a Dante poem. And it's about the experience of exile, which is what I wanted to write about. But the more I started to see that there was a sectarian component to this exile population, um, my editor and I agreed that the Eclipse of the Sunnis was a, a, a better title. For, for Americans, that title really doesn't mean much. Mm -hmm. uh, a play on words, maybe. They see the, the, the picture on the front. It's a, a disturbed man. Um, Middle Easterners look at that title, and it's, it's shocking. Mm -hmm. to, it, it's like a slap in the face. And I was talking to a friend in Beirut who'd said he'd heard about the book. And I said, well, I hope that it makes it to the shelves of an English language bookstore in Beirut, but I bet no one will put it in the window. Uh, it, it is so provocative as a title. Now, who am I talking about? As you know, this is a region where Sunni Muslims are the majority in most countries in the Middle East. And Shiites have been an aggrieved minority. Iraq was a different kind of place. Iraq had an aggrieved majority. They were under the thumb of the Sunnis uh, for, for a long time. Uh, the invasion changed the equation. The American invasion changed the equation in Iraq. They became, um, the, the, uh, you know, for the first time ever, Arab Shias became the, the ruling sect uh, in Iraq. So I am at first talking about Iraq. It is a sectarian divide there. But I also argue in this book that because of the American invasion, that Sunni-Shia divide, which is more a power divide than a religious one, has seeped throughout the social fabric in all the countries of the Middle East, that there is now a divide that people feel, uh, not religious, mostly political. Uh, and it has um, disturbed the region. Uh, and the region hasn't come to terms yet with what Iraq has become, what it will become, and what this American invasion means. 
What are some of the ways you've seen this divide play out? You, you write a lot about the regional consequences or the unintended consequences, as you put it, of removing Saddam Hussein's regime. Um, obviously, this eclipse of the Sunnis was, was one of the unintended consequences. Um, what else have you seen and documented? You know, on the ground in Iraq, uh, it became apparent somewhere around 2004 when, when we first arrived. We didn't ask anybody who came to work for us what they were. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very American not to ask. Um, but it was very clear when we would take translators out to different neighborhoods. It, it, w we learned that you couldn't take uh, a Shiite into a Sunni neighborhood or a Sunni into a Shia neighborhood. So there's all that grassroots divide that you feel in Iraq, but still there today. Uh, most of the neighborhoods have become un unmixed. Before 2003, Sunnis and Shias would live in the same neighborhoods. Now that, that, is, most, that is less likely. Um, let's remember it was the Jordanian king who spoke early on about something that he called uh, the Shia Crescent. Mm -hmm. um, and what he was talking about is he is a, a man who uh, rules a predominantly Sunni country, that's Jordan, and he was worried about the rising power of Iran, that what the invasion had done was to take Saddam out of the equation, uh, and that was Iran's biggest enemy. And the Jordanian king said it out loud. Uh, other Arab leaders felt it acutely but didn't say it out loud, that this was a moment that Iran uh, ha had become a more powerful force in the country. So that is the geopolitical Sunni-Shia divide. And where you see this played out is certainly in Lebanon. Um, you see it played out in Syria, uh, in Saudi Arabia and Egypt, in all the places where you have Sunni Shia populations, um, you know, it is played out in different ways. But as I said earlier, this is a political divide, not a religious divide. This is not people who are fighting in the mosques. This, this, is, this is about how politics and power are going to be realigned in the region, and nobody really has an answer to that yet. And these, you, you mentioned some of the surrounding countries. You mentioned Jordan and Lebanon and Syria and Saudi Arabia. Um, one of the things you touch on, and, and in the cases of uh, Jordan and, and Lebanon, you write about this in great detail, um, is the impact that Iraq has had on those countries, uh, but also what some of those countries and what some of those regimes in the Middle East are doing inside Iraq, um, especially Jordan and Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. Um, do you see any possibility for a stable Iraq with the pressure that a lot of these countries exert? Um, it depends on how strong Ir Iraq comes out of this election, but there's, here's a couple of examples. The Saudi Arabian king has never actually met with uh, the Iraqi prime minister, who is a Shiite. Um, Saudi Arabia is a predominantly Sunni country. Um, it, they have not put an ambassador in. Other, other Arab countries have done so, but the Saudis have resisted putting an ambassador into Iraq, and it's unclear to me what that relationship is going to be. When Saddam was in power, the Saudis uh, and, and Iraq actually were quite close and fought on the same side uh, in the Iran-Iraq war. Um, and so that relationship will, will evolve over time. Where you really see the divide uh, is in Lebanon. Very early on, there were Sunnis in Lebanon who joined uh, the uh, jihadist insurgents, whatever you want to call them, inside of Iraq, and they felt that it was their place to go and fight. And what they were fighting for was Sunni hegemony in the region. Um, not, again, not in the mosque, but as a political battle. And there were many of them who went to Iraq who were trained in urban warfare and then came home. Uh, and as you know, this actually created a crisis in Lebanon. Um, there was a group called Fatah al-Islam. These were people who had come back from Iraq, who had gone through Syria into northern Lebanon, and you know there was a clash in the country over this. I spoke to a Sunni imam whose job it was uh, to uh, bring these young men, who now were in jail, some of them, uh, back into a nonviolent way to express their, their views. But, you know, the thing that he noted about all of the people who are on the terrorism wing uh, in a Lebanese prison is they were all Sunnis. Mm -hmm. And this bothered him greatly. 